Tonight on Front Row Late, I'm speaking to one of Britain's most popular authors, Philip Pullman. Fame came to Pullman relatively late in life. Having spent many years as a school teacher, it was in the late 1980s that he began to achieve success as an author of children's novels. But what cemented Pullman's place in the world of books was his wonderful trilogy, His Dark Materials, which was partly inspired by Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost. And to date, it sold over 15 million copies worldwide. The phenomenal success of Pullman's books has led to a stage adaptation by the National Theatre, a Hollywood movie, and an upcoming BBC drama series starring James McAvoy, Ruth Wilson and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Much of Pullman's fiction is set in an alternative version of Oxford, where he's lived for most of his life. And it was there, at his home, that we met. Philip, I'm going to start by being um, frank. Mm -hmm. right? and, you know, if you were to say to me, um, "Do you like fantasy fiction?" You know, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly shake my head. You know. So would I. <laughs> Good. But I've really, really enjoyed Dark Materials. And I think it's because every sentence does a brilliant job. There's not an adjective wasted. Every sentence has a nice rhythm. You can read it aloud in your head and it lands in the right place. Uh, uh, how the hell did you learn to do that? Well, thank you. We can start there, can't we? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a lovely, lovely uh, compliment. Thank you very much. Well, um, I had a long apprenticeship uh, because when I was a teacher, I used to tell stories from the Greek myths and the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, tell them, not read them. And I knew that uh, when the idea for this long sort of epic-y thing uh, came to me, I knew, I knew I had the technical means to do it. Um, you mentioned rhythm, for example. Yeah. Um, I'm very conscious of the rhythm of, of what I write because uh, because prose does have a prosody. It does have a, it does, you yeah. know, a, a meter, and you have to be conscious of that. Um, mm. If you're going to make, make the prose sort of bounce mm. and swing a bit. When I was very young, um, I remember reading uh, Hiawatha, and I didn't know that it was uh, not iambic, yeah. but whatever it is, yeah. trochaic or something. Um, but I was struck by the fact that it didn't go da dum da dum da dum da dum. It went da dum da 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 da. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was very clever yeah. of him. Um, actually, once you got used to it, you can make it up by the yard. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but, but yeah, I, I, was, yeah. I was aware of that, you know, yeah. when I was about nine. Yeah. Most people don't have a consciousness of that, I think. Well, I'm always astonished by writers who said, um, you know, I listened to Haydn all the way through writing this, or I, this is the album I played while I was writing. So, what, were you, what, what, what were you listening to? Listen yeah. to yourself. Yoffel's red tongue lolled down, dripping over his open throat. The Bear King was suddenly voiceless, biteless, helpless. Yorick needed nothing more. He lunged, and then his teeth were in Yoffel's throat, and he shook and shook this way, that way, lifting the huge body off the ground and battering it down as if Yoffel were no more than a seal at the water's edge. Then he ripped upwards, and Yoffel Ragnarsson's life came away in his teeth. Very few writers have got you know, get their adjectives and adverbs right. I mean, there are either too many of the bloody things yeah. or not enough. Yeah. And that's also about, I mean, I suppose it's about putting yourself in the position of the reader, isn't it? I think it's something to do with what Conrad said. Um, he wanted to make the reader feel, he wanted to make the reader think, but above all, he wanted to make the reader see. Yeah. Um, and I'm conscious, um, each time I write a scene, of what I would want to know if I were reading it. Yeah. Where are we? Yeah. Yeah. What's the weather like if we're outside? Yeah. Where's the light yeah. coming from yeah. if we're inside? Who's present? What yeah. impression would I get of the room if I walked into it? That, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
If, for example, when you have a scene in a film, as soon as you uh, g come into a scene, you, you know, you, you see the room, you see the people there, you, you, you see that and you're, that gives you the basic information. I was very struck by a film, um, which I saw not all that long ago, where the director would open each scene with a close-up of someone's face and you would say, bring the camera back a I, bit, where are we? What the yeah, hell's going yeah. on? I find the very idea of writing fiction absolutely terrifying. I mean, the idea of inventing a story Mm. From, from scratch. But I was really struck when I was reading some of your essays in this collection, Demon mm. Voices. I was really struck by how what you were talking about in terms of writing fictional stories just kind of sang with me for people uh, who were writing history. You know? mm. And you say something like, um, there's no joy comparable than what goes along with having a new idea. Yeah, <laughs> I think right. that's, you know, when I get a new idea, you know, it's orgasmic pleasure for, that lasts for days. Yeah, it, uh, yes, that's right. I, the, the moment for me that um, eclipses all others was when I realised very early on in the writing of um, Northern Lights what I could do with the idea of demons. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I got the demon idea, but um, it wasn't doing anything, it wasn't productive, it wasn't saying anything, uh, it wasn't expressive, um, until I was, went for a walk around the garden, not this garden, the previous house, and um, suddenly I saw what I could do with it. It's, of course, it's the difference between adults and children. And that moment was, uh, you know, the sun came out and the universe played a great chord of C major and uh, yeah, <laughs> glory yes. shone around. Yes. <laughs> and nothing is better. And then you have the pleasure of, of honing it and getting it across and yeah. putting it into the words that are best for the idea. Yes. And that's... Yes, that's right. But there's a lot of exploration too. I mean, I think, well, I think, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing nicer than writing something that you feel pleased with. Yeah. There's nothing nastier than, you know, hitting the rocks. I mean, do you ever hit the rocks? Uh, yeah, quite frequently, but I don't, I don't bother about that. I was very struck when I read, um, I've got it here somewhere, the letters of Van Gogh, who was a wonderful writer, actually, in his letters. And he said, they talk about the painter's fear of the blank canvas. Let me tell you, he said, the canvas is much more afraid of the painter. And that's, you know, the page is afraid of what you're going to... And the other, the other defence against it is, is, is habit. Habit is the writer's best friend. Habit has written far more books than talent has. So what's your habit? Going to the desk in the morning and staying there. That's, that's what you need to do. If you want the muse to visit you, <laughs> she needs to know where you are. So go to your desk. That's where she comes. If, you, you know, if she comes and you're not there, she'll go away again. Inspiration is, is, something like, is something unpredictable. You know, it's a gift of the gods or something. But you can rely on the, the habit of okay. writing three pages every day, though. It, I mean, do you have a target? Yeah, I write three pages by hand, three A4 pages every day. You write, so that's a thousand words? Yeah, about a thousand, yeah. And you cross out? Cross out a lot, yeah, yes. Uh, sometimes you go up an entire um, cul-de-sac, which might occupy you for a chapter or two. Well, too bad, cut it out, go back to where you, was, where you were on the right track. This is, this is, the, this is the, 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 one of the reasons for not planning. You see, if you, if you set out a scenario for the whole book, as I think P.G. Woodhouse did, you know, write a sort of 30,000-word synopsis of what he later went on to expand to 50,000 or something. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that in a million years. I got to explore. I got to find out what I want to say. I've come to the, to the belief that structure is actually a superficial feature of narrative. A fun the fundamental feature is the tone in which you tell the story. But you can change the structure at the last minute. You can take yeah. the beginning and put it somewhere else. You can decide to start in medias res. You can, you, can, you can fool about with the structure when it's quite late on. So structure, people think a story, it, it isn't yeah. built on okay. structure. Structure is something you can fiddle with later on. But tone you can't. No, you can't, because yeah. to, to change the tone, you have to rewrite every single yeah. sentence yeah. Yeah. in yeah. a different voice. Yeah. So structure um, isn't fundamental. I mean, that's that's my. Though it can be very, um, you can struggle with it a lot, can't you? Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah. But, but the time to struggle, um, I, I, the time to struggle with the structure is when you've got the whole thing written. There's something about though still, the, the kind of, a relationship to to words, a relationship mm. to language.
which comes over, really sings out for me in what you write. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I do, I do consider quite carefully the words I use and I do try, try, try and get things right, even to the extent of correcting them when I find I've got them wrong. The word enormity, for example, I once used to mean something big and of course it isn't, it's something quite different. So, um, so I look things up constantly. My first port of call is Chambers. Uh, <laughs> Chambers is 1960 edition. And I do like to know the etymology of words I use. Yeah. Like fruition, for example, has not, nothing to do with fruit, really. Isn't it? Well, it's, it's to do with enjoyment. Oh, of course, fruit, Latin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should know that. But what comes out for me, and some of the things you say that you don't quite put it this way, is that there's also a kind of sense that language that can be really dangerous. Words are dangerous things, mm. or they can be dangerous in the wrong hands. Do you, do you feel that? Uh, yes, I do. Um, and I'm very interested in what politicians do with language yeah. and what um, uh, journalists and TV news people do with language. Uh, yes, this is where, this is where media studies is so misunderstood. Um, it's a common it's a common target of ridicule and contempt. It's rhetoric. It's exactly what the Romans would have called and the Greeks would have called rhetoric. It's a study of how you how you arrange an argument, how you assemble the argument, how you gather the examples you need, how you present it. I, I think um, if the great um, r early writers, the great classical writers on rhetoric um, were aware of television, they would be absolute masters of it yeah. because that's what, that's what rhetoric is all about. Yeah. And the, the, the study of, um, well, call it rhetoric, the study of that now should include, um, of course, images, how they're used, how they're focused, how they're shot, where the camera is, all that stuff which um, is so interesting yeah, and yeah, so important to us as yeah, a, as a yeah. democracy, yeah. Uh, we really need to study it. And we really need to talk about it in school and in university and, yeah. and, 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 and make it understood. Does that, that sense that, you know, that words, words have to be looked after, really, and looked to? Yes, take care of them. Yeah. Um, make sure you know the meaning of them. Yeah. Uh, look them up. Take care to get things like who and whom right. Um, oh, people would say you're a pedant there. Let them. <laughs> if it doesn't make any difference, people won't mind if you use the right one, will they? <laughs> because I'm... if the people who don't notice won't notice anyway. Yeah. But those who do notice will, will be, you know, yeah. will yeah. notice. Yeah, yeah. I notice you're on Twitter. Yeah. Does that have anything to add to <laughs> this? You know, what's your philosophy of, of the Twitter sphere? Uh, Why the... are you on it? <laughs> Uh, because it's such an interesting form, you, you've got a very limited number of characters. Some people yeah. sort of cheat and have a whole chain going. Yes, I think that's a real cheat. You know, so you do I. One out of seven, two oh, out of seven. You know, for me. go and write, write a, a book. Yeah. Write an article. Yeah. I also like the fact that if I read a book I like or listen to a, um, a CD I like, I can say so on Twitter. So I can, I can praise yeah. people on Twitter, which I do. I praised Hilary McKay's recent um, novel, The Skylark's War. I praised um, uh, a piano CD by Stephen Huff and another one by um, uh, Stephen Osborne that I like very much. And so that, that's good. I also like exchanging, um, exchanging, you know, I suppose you call it banter or something. Um, you must get flooded with people writing to you asking questions? Uh, yeah, readers are when books become democratic. What I mean by that is when you write a book, what's, whatever sort of book it is, when you write, you're a tyrant, you're um, a despot. But when the book is published and out there in the marketplace, it's the whole process changes, it becomes democratic. I can't tell people what to think of my books, I can't tell them what they mean. There's an essay in there about um, about that very thing. I think you know what 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 what, what, what happens when someone says, "Am I allowed to read this into it?" Yeah. Of course you are. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you what to read yeah. into it. My view of what the book means is no more final than anybody else's. The meaning emerges from the space between the book and the reader. I've done my part, and, and I have no part in that. That's why it's democratic. And that goes on to adaptations on film and television. I mean, there's a BBC One. Um, uh, adaptation of uh, Dark Materials yeah. in production. Um, I suppose this has always happened. Um, when Dickens was writing 
Oliver Twist. There were something like six adaptations of it going on the stage already before we'd even finished it. And, and you... so the, people have always adapted stories and done that. So I don't um, take, I'm not worried about that at all. And so you don't mind how it's done? <sighs> Well, I sort of mind, but the degree to which I mind is considerably modified by the amount of money that um, <laughs> they pay me. <laughs> uh, no, I don't mind, because um, the, the book is still there. And if people don't like that adaptation, well, they can read the book. I, this is my favourite quotation from Dr Johnson. The true end of writing is to enable the reader better to enjoy life or better to endure it. <laughs> so if you write something that gives people pleasure, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. It's, there's yeah. a virtue in that. Yeah. But you quote, again, in these essays, some of the letters that or emails probably that mm. you've had uh, from um, from kids with school projects. Yes. I, mean, now, I think we all get these in different ways. You know, I've got, you know, mm. dear Miss Beard, I have been told to reach out to an expert. Can you tell me all you know about Roman women? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I kind of think, <laughs> right, read a book, you know, might be a, might be a yes. start. But there yeah. was a, you quoted a wonderful one. Um, is that the How obituary that? one? Well, there was, that, that was all, uh, yeah. saying, you know, I've, got a, I've been asked to write an obituary of somebody and no-one had chosen you. And can you tell me how you would like to die and can you make it as dramatic <laughs> as possible? possible. <laughs> you know, now, just, you know, you, you have to feel sorry for these kids because they, they have precisely been told to write yeah. an email to, you know, choose someone famous, write and ask them to, um, yeah. you know. But you also know that they'll be getting brownie points in their project for having reached out to an expert and had an expert uh, right back. I mean, it's terrible. It's it's terrible. Um, the way we test children now should be banned. We should be forbidden to do it. We shouldn't treat literature like that as something to be ransacked for the right answer. We shouldn't treat them as, uh, you know, fodder for tests and um, uh, material to boost your school and the league tables, all that. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. Yeah, I, I doubt there's many school teachers coming into a class of 12-year-olds now and telling, saying we're going to do another, we're going to have another story from the Odyssey today. No, I'm, I wouldn't be allowed to do that now. I wouldn't be allowed to do it, uh, and the, the the joy of the joy of the, well the Iliad in particular was um, getting to the bit, I don't know the bit where um, Priam comes and gets Hector's body from Achilles, and you know it's 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 such a such a wonderful or, or, or the bit where um, Achilles, having heard of the death of Patroclus, goes and stands on the wall and looks out at the sun setting and the sh sh you, uh, It's fabulous. And then you can arrange it so that happens just as the bell goes. You see, that's what you're learning, isn't it? That in some ways I kind of, I look at what you write and I look at its, its um, confident formation. And, I, and then yeah. I think, you know, you knew how to finish the story at exactly the moment. Yeah. The, you know, but other, you didn't... other little things too, like in, in, the, in Northern Lights in particular, there's a, um, the uh, uh, fight between the bears, the armoured bears. Yeah. And I use a couple of epic similes there, which I got, I suppose, ultimately from the classics, but mainly from Milton. Yeah, who got um, it from the classics. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm conscious of being in a tradition, I think. And with that trilogy in particular, I think the tradition was an epic one. Like two great masses of rock balanced on adjoining peaks and shaken loose by an earthquake that bound down the mountainsides, gathering speed, leaping over crevasses and knocking trees into splinters until they crash into each other so hard that both are smashed to powder and flying chips of stone. That was how the two bears came together. The crash as they met resounded in the still air and echoed back from the palace wall. But they weren't destroyed as rock would have been. They both fell aside and the first to rise was Yorick. I mean, it's a tradition also of not just storytelling, but of kind of myth making too, mm. isn't it? And you know, I yeah. wondered what you what you thought. You know, thinking back to um, the kids in the classroom, what did they take away from uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey? I do know they enjoyed the stories, so they'll have a kind of a kind of memory of it. Not a not an exam passing memory, but I wasn't aiming for that. I was aiming them to, for, for them to had the experience of, um, well, empathising, feeling with Orpheus. Yeah. 
It's probably C.S. Lewis, who is in many ways my bugbear, but he was, he was quite right about this. He says a, a story like the Orpheus one, a mythical story, is one that sort of um, is independent of how it's told. You, you, you've yeah. got the events of the story, they yeah. themselves have the, the yeah. emotional effect on you, and you never forget and when you first, you know, yeah. you never yeah. forget that story having heard it once. But it, it also does more than give pleasure and memory, I think. It doesn't it also take you into different ways of thinking yeah. about the world. Yes, 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 you're quite right. Um, when you hear, probably when you hear first, the story of the Cyclops and hiding under the sheep and blinding, all that stuff, when you hear those at first, you're in a world where um, you sort of know it, it's not real, but you, you're willing to pretend it's real yeah. for the time you hear the story. This is where a, a, a comment People who comment on stories, like Richard Dawkins, I got a piece on Richard Dawkins' yeah. there and his view of fairy tales, yeah. which is that they're not true and because frogs don't change into princes. Well, that's not the best way of seeing the story. <laughs> um, we have to give children fairy tales because it enlarges our imagination. It enlarges our imaginary vocabulary. And it, it enlarges yeah. our ways we have of thinking about things. Yeah, and how you how you consume, in the most literal sense, how you consume the world. Mm. It teaches yeah. you to yeah. do that that's in some right. way, and teaches you different ways of doing that. Yes. Isn't it? And so, well, that's what religion does. Yeah. Um, at least that's what the Christianity I grew up in did, it, yeah. because it provided a story, a, a, a fascinating story, um, which said, well, this is why we're here. This is what we're doing here. This is how we got here, and this is what we've got to do to go to heaven. And that's, that, that was a story, and it satisfied because it was a story. You call yourself a Church of England atheist, yes. don't you? <laughs> but, I mean, 1662 like Book of Common Prayer, yeah. specifically atheist. <laughs> well, so, me too. Yeah. Um, in my case, and I wonder if it's the same for you, my case, I would really, really love to believe it. I'd love to, to, to believe that God was controlling this. I, I'm jealous of people who believe. Are you? Uh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, do I miss it? Um, I suppose I do miss it a bit. I mean, the, the story about justice is a very attractive one. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. he's going to get his comeuppance yeah. when he goes before. That, yeah, that's it. Yeah. He'll some, find some out. Some Peter will know what to do with him. To <laughs> serve him right. Yeah. That's a very attractive thing. Yeah. And actually, I think that's what lies behind the attractiveness of fairy tales, because they always end yeah. with the bad people being punished and the good people being rewarded. And, and that's um, why Dawkins, to me, is a very um, rebarbative, offers a very rebarbative view of... He's got a very strict view. If it's yeah. not scientifically true, it's not worth reading. He's a man of immense principle, um, but I think he's, he's wrong about fairy tales. <laughs> And the, yeah. the, 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 the function of stories is not to tell us scientific truths, but to tell us truths in another, of another sort, yeah. in another form, yeah. and to give yeah. us things to imagine with. Yeah, yeah. I still think reluctant atheism is, is kind of more attractive than yeah. messianic atheism. Well, well I mean, um, zealots of any kind are unattractive. Yeah. Yeah. Zealotry of any kind yeah. is unattractive. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> I'd rather, th there's a word I learned recently, um, possibilianism. Have you come across <laughs> possibilianism? The American neuroscientist David Eagleman wrote a very good little book called Sum, or Sum probably, which is um, 40 different glimpses of what the after afterlife might be like. It's absolutely fascinating, very inventive and very funny. Um, but he's a possibilian, he says. He th he, he's prepared to believe in anything, um, provided... Uh, Provided it's convincing, yeah. he, he's not going to shut anything out. Yeah, um, and I, I'm very sympathetic to that idea. Yeah. You don't have much truck with quite a lot of um, children's literature, like well, like Narnia and like Winnie the Pooh. You're very keen on the idea that children grow up. That's the beef I have with Narnia, um, which is, you, you know, if you read the whole sequence, you realise that uh, 
the Lewis who wrote Narnia had a pathological fear and dislike of women and girls. And the whole process of growing up was so horrid that he wanted to pr preserve his children from this dreadful thing. Mm. And he kills them in a railway accident mm. at the end, and that's supposed mm. to be all happy and glorious. Um, I think it's an utterly miserable thing to say and a position to take up. I don't like it at all. Winnie the Pooh I dislike for different reasons. Um, it comes from that period um, of uh, our literary culture when um, a. A. Milne was editing Punch, and purely by chance, I happen to have on the voice of my mother's collection of bound volumes of Punch from that era. And if you look through the Punch from, uh, of that time, it's full of cartoons of twee little children in a state of semi-nudity, doing cute things or saying cute things. Yeah. It's a bit creepy, and there's something about that world which belongs also to the Winnie the Pooh world. Yeah. And I don't, I just don't get it. No. I just don't like the idea of this never growing up business. That's, you know, because actually, mm. you know, we know that kids, yes. don't, they want to grow up. Of course they do, it's what, what they want more than anything <laughs> yes. else. They don't play at being children, they play at being grown-ups. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we know what happened to the real Christopher Robin, which, which was, um, um, he was blighted, his life was blighted by this. Yeah. Yes. Um, th this thing. Yeah. Um, so th th yes, those are books I don't like, but there are there are plenty of books I do like. Yeah. Children's books I do like. Um, I love the Emil books. And Eric the Kessner and the detectives. Emil and the detectives. That's a that's a wonderful book because it's but well because it's realistic. It's real. Emil um, is uh, in uh, Germany in the early thirties. Um, he lives in a little town. His mother sends him to visit his grandmother in the big city and gives him a bit of money to take to her. He falls asleep in the train and a wicked man steals it. And um, Emil, together with the help of realistically depicted boys who come together um, to do this, track down the thief and get him arrested. It's realistic. It's a, it's a slight tale in one way, but it's a wonderful affirmation of real life, real emotions. Emil is distraught because he's lost this money that he was going to take to his grandmother. And there's another thread to the story as well, which is that his mother's a widow and she's, um, she's, she's being attended to by the local police inspector, Inspector Yeshko. And um, he's a nice enough chap. And Emil likes him, but whether he'd like him as a fa as a stepfather, he's very unsure about. And this is this becomes explored more fully in the second book, Emil and the Three oh, Twins. No, I, uh, people don't read Emil and the Three Twins, do no, they? No, they should. Um, I think it's a marvelous book. There's no, not a, not a drop of magic or fantasy anywhere in Emil, but it's 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 wonderfully good. You set the first dark materials in a kind of another Oxford, a sort of, mm. you know, where it's a para-Oxford. And um, that's, of course, where you went to read English before becoming a teacher. You have a nice line about the different kind of world that both of us experienced at universities. Mm. I mean, we weren't destitute, but we weren't particularly posh. That's right. Um, we went to university um, with maintenance grants. Um, yes. And no fees. Tuition fees are paid. Uh, well, yeah, it's a different and world. you say at one point, and I totally feel this. Um, it it felt rather like civilization. Yes. <laughs> um, well, well, just the fact that this all this wonderful stuff was available to me from from, from a family who had had no tradition of university yeah, attendance yeah. at all. I think it was probably the first. Yes, I, I was the first person in my family yeah. to to get a degree. Yeah. And and you see now that 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 is just it's gone. That's gone. It's, it's part of it's part of a whole network of things that included council housing, um, public libraries, um, parks, all that sort of stuff. A, a kind of civic decency that used to that sustained my childhood and yeah. no doubt yours. Yeah. Um, and it's going if it hasn't gone. Yeah. It's uh, it's a great and irreparable loss, a terrible loss. And we've let it happen. But what do I mean by we? Do I mean you and I? Well, we wouldn't have let it go. So it's they who let it go.
possessed by this market fundamentalism, this idea that the that competition and the market and the price of everything is what matters most. We're still under that spell. Yeah. It's just like a fairy tale, as if we've been under the spell of a wicked witch or a wicked sorcerer. And we or have something. not. I mean well, we have we partly have ourselves to blame because we we disapproved, but we didn't disapprove effectively. Yes, but the system we had, our voting system, didn't allow us to express our disapproval in a way that would have been effective. The, the system is broken. If you live in a, in a safe seat, you might as well not vote. Whether you agree with the incumbent or not, you might as well not vote. So that disenfranchises an enormous number of people um, whose opinions really ought to be, if they vote at all, ought to be represented somewhere. You know, maybe as part of a coalition or as a minority party in government, but they ought to be represented. And then we would have had a much wider discussion, a much better discussion, um, about the future of such things as universal education, free education, li public libraries. We've lost that decency we used to have. But if we, I mean, what would you do? I mean, come on, I mean, because I think we share a distaste for some of that loss of decency, mm -hmm. um, for the priorities of education for you know for for league tables for competition we both think that that's um you know that's cheapening actually yes. but what do we do about it well we put up taxes we tax tax people a lot harder hit the rich i mean i'm rich and i don't yeah. i pay all the tax i should but i should yeah. be paying much more yeah I'm not such a fool as I'm going to pay it anyway without being... Because everybody should pay it. Yeah. Go after the big companies, the big corporations that don't pay tax at all yeah. uh, and spend it on, 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 on that very thing, public decency. Yeah. I've, I have always been amazed at the idea that, that raising taxes is seen to be a vote loser. Well, it's, it's a... what you do with the money, isn't it? Exactly. Well, you're not giving it to the tax man. You're giving it to the people who are going to kill your heart attack in ten yeah. years' time. Yeah. You're going to keep, give it yeah. to the. Yeah. Um, we, we've got the. We have. We've had the wrong lessons being taught us for the last. For nearly forty years now. Yeah, but you, you've been a beneficiary in some ways. Of, of course, I have. I, I was very lucky. I mean, the generation that was born just after the war, like me, um, had the best of everything. I think, yeah. but because I'm aware of that, because I'm conscious of having had the best of everything, um, I'm more and more angry that it's being taken away. Um, and I want to restore it. I want to go back. Mind you, the big difference, the big thing we have to do better is um, climate change, of course. That's the biggest threat that lies over us, the biggest thing that's going to wipe us out. Um, and we've got to do something about that. We've and got it, to. And it's very hard to make... It's very hard uh, make, to do it as a, as a solitary country. It's also hard because it... it demands selflessness, actually, because, you know, climate yeah. change is not going to, in any really tangible way, going to affect you and me, because we're going to be long gone before. But I... Have human beings ever looked, you know, 2,000 years ahead and I must do this for the sake of my remote descendants? We're not, we're not made like that. No. Um, we, we're, we're immensely in genius and we've transformed the physical nature of the world and the weather and everything else in our 5,000 years of technological development, um, but we haven't developed emotionally or um, philosophically. We're short-termists. We are, we? and that's uh, what will probably kill us. There's probably a Greek word for that. <laughs> <laughs> Rather grim view. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I also wanted to ask you, um, the kind of success you've had in our knighthood and, um, and you know, filmic literary success, but it it came quite late, thirty years ago. No one had heard of Philip Pullman. I think. Good thing too. I, Why I, do you say know, that? Well, I'm 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 able to deal with it much better. Yeah, I'm much more sort of level about it. If I'd had a huge success with my very first book at the age of twenty-five or something, I, I, that would have been a bad thing. And I think it probably unbalances you as a person if you have success too early, too soon. I was sort of phlegmatic about the whole thing um, before the big success happened with Northern Lights. Well, you know, they're not reading me now. They will. They will. So that's super self-confident too. Well, yeah, or arrogance yeah. or something. <laughs> well, same thing. Um, I wasn't really worried. I mean, no. you know, yeah, all right, so I have to earn a living, but other people have to do that too. Um, 
I can still write books and they'll still be around on the shelves of the Bodleian Library if nowhere else. Oh, yeah. I'll be rediscovered in 500 years' time. <laughs> I rather doubt I will be, but I, I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very pleased that I didn't do a, you know, a moment of telly until I was in my mid fifties. Mm. And I, cause for the same reason that, yeah. you know, what would it be like to have that kind of public success when you were very yeah. young? Uh, it would unbalance you. The only trouble with being poor and obscure is the poverty. And the only yeah. trouble with being rich and famous is the fame. What advice do you give young authors? Uh, well, read. I wish they'd read a bit more. I wish everybody'd read a bit more. But I was talking to a young poet once, um, and I said, um, well, what poems do you know by heart? And he said, I don't know any poems by heart. What do you mean? I, I was sort of flabbergasted by that. Because um, I know stacks of poetry by heart, so do you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you no, know, he didn't seem to think it was... Were you made to, were you, were you made to learn poetry at school? Uh, a little bit, but not as much as I did, because I loved poetry. Yeah. I mean, as soon as I read The Raven, for example, I almost knew it. Yeah. Once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary yeah. over many a quaint and curious volume, I forgot. It's, 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 it's a wonderful thing to bring out when you're feeling bored or <laughs> on a long car journey. Yeah, yeah. I had an excellent school teacher who actually bribed us. Ah. We got paid to learn. I remember that um, we Can got... Can you still recall what you, what you learned I, I learned proof rock all the way through, that was 50p. Well, not, I remember it was 50p. 50p. I can't do it now, but I can yeah. do chunks of it. But none of us managed to get the fiver for the wreck of the Deutschland. Oh, crikey. <laughs> can I ask you, you know, as we kind of begin to wrap up, with, with a, you're looking forward to going to Buckingham Palace and have the sword on your shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> You've been before. <laughs> yes, I've been before. Um, I went when I was seven, actually. Um, my father, who was in the RAF, um, was killed in a flying accident and he was given the D DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross, posthumously. And my mother and my brother and I were invited to Buckingham Palace to be invested with this medal of his posthumously. So I, I went when I was very young. You're a DBE, aren't you? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm not a... the BE doesn't come into it. Oh, you don't have an empire? You don't, you're not attached N to the no, empire? No, oh, that's no, lucky, Night Bachelor. It? I was very struck by something that the historian David Olusoga said in a piece quite recently, saying why he had accepted the OBE, despite the empire associations. He obviously thought about it very hard, and it's because he thought it was a good thing to see people who look like him yeah. on the honours list, and I completely agree. Yeah. Um, it ought to represent every, yeah. every kind yeah. of, everything that happens, yeah. and every yeah. kind of person who is British. Yeah. I think that's important. Uh, so I was, yes. I, I was conscious that I was kind of representing um, the world of letters, yeah. as it were. Yeah, and I that should yeah, be I there. We're all very pleased that the world of letters has got you as a sir. So. Well, that's nice. Thank you. So, thank you very much for it. Thank you, Mary. I very much <laughs> enjoyed it.